Locked On Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings to all the 12s out there. It's Blue Friday here on Locked On Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me for our Friday show, my co-host, Nick Lee. We've got kickoff quickly approaching in Houston. The Seahawks getting ready to play against the 2-10 and 10 Texans. As we do each and every Friday, we're going to be breaking down our keys to a Seahawks victory, dishing out our picks to click, going through final injury reports, and much more. Glad to have you listening in to Locked on Seahawks as your first listen. We're available each and every day on all platforms. Now for your lead story here on Locked on Seahawks. As of the time of this recording, we haven't gotten the final injury report for the Seahawks. We don't know which players are questionable, doubtful. There's no probable designation anymore, but we don't know that at this point. But Nick, Looking at the way the injury report has played out the first couple days of this practice week, Seattle certainly has some key players that could be in doubt for this game. And maybe the one that jumps out the most, considering Jamal Adams just had surgery on his shoulder yesterday and he's done for the season, Quandre Diggs has not practiced yet this week with a calf injury. They might be calling me out of retirement to play safety if he can't play in this game. Yeah, the, I know UW isn't playing in a bowl game, so maybe they can call up the UW safeties. <laughs> Sorry to rub salt in the wound for all the dog fans out there, but yeah, I mean, really, that that's it's a dire situation if if at safety if if Quandre Diggs doesn't play, and I'm not going to say that's going to be the difference between winning and losing against a two and ten team, but it might make for more a bit more heartburn, that's for sure, when you don't have your two Pro Bowl safeties. I I truly believe that the Seahawks have one of the better more complimentary safety duos in the NFL when you talk about Quandre Diggs' skill set versus Jamal Adams. And not having either of them in the game in, the, in this scenario could could uh, cause for a bit more heartburn than what is necessary. Um, and, of course, we, we always we know the offensive line is banged up. you got Kyle Fuller and uh, Brandon Shell banged up as, in there as well. And you might have a pretty uh, patchwork offensive line, especially on the right side. And that uh, – you know, I, I hate to do this because I know this isn't like Alabama versus, you know, Alcorn State or something. And where, you know, it's a foregone conclusion. It's the NFL any given Sunday. But if I had to pick a week where the Seahawks were a bit banged up and you might need to rest guys or guys are out that uh, been, you've been able to rely on all year, this is one of the maybe two or three games on the schedule where you might be able to get away with that. And um, and especially if you're, if you're looking to really, truly build on that 3% <laughs> playoff push, now, this is a game where maybe you don't want to risk a Quandre Diggs. You don't want to risk a guy or, or DK Metcalf, even if he's banged up a bit. I know he's been out uh, of several practices um, throughout the year and still played. But um, the offensive line is one, especially where th this is a good game for inexperienced guys to get in there, get in the trenches, and open up some holes for the running backs because, boy, those holes have been there on the Texans' defense. Yeah, this is a team, this is an opponent they're going up against where maybe you can afford to rest a few players. I mean, it's already been a foregone conclusion, at least based on what Pete Carroll said, that Brandon Shell is not going to play this week. He's been dealing with a shoulder issue for several weeks in a row that has ultimately been impacting him late in games. It's an injury where fatigue really comes into play, and then he's just not able to drive guys off the ball. You can't have that as an offensive lineman. And so they're hoping if they give him this week off, that maybe he can turn the corner and he could be available when they play the Rams in week 15. They win this weekend. They'll be five and eight going into that game, two game winning streak, try to get some momentum going against their division rivals, maybe get the win on the road. They're going to need that win if they want to get to the playoffs, but uh, this would be a matchup where maybe you can get away with that. And that would mean Jake Kieran or St uh, Stone Forsyth is going to be starting at right tackle. So you're going to have a rookie in the lineup. If that ends up being the case that Shell's not playing the good news up front is that they do look like they're going to have Damian Lewis. Obviously, Pete Carroll has not come out and said he's going to play yet definitively, but he was a full participant in practice on Wednesday and Thursday, dealing with an elbow issue as well as a shoulder issue. But it sounds like he has turned the corner with those injuries and has a chance to be able to play this weekend. That would be a big boost, particularly to their run game, having him back at his left guard spot. I thought Jake Karen did okay playing there this past weekend. Kyle Fuller really struggled playing left guard. That was not a good fit for him. But Damian Lewis getting him back 
really going to jolt the run game, and, and you hope that he can be an upgrade in pass protection there compared to the other two players as well. So it'd be nice to get him back. You're going to be fairly healthy with the rest of your offensive line as well. The Metcalf situation, based on what we've seen this year, I wouldn't be worried about him not playing on Sunday because he has missed practice pretty much every week dealing with this lingering foot problem. But you add this illness on top, then maybe that creates a little more doubt. And against this particular opponent, I can't see DK Metcalf being willing to sit out, though. I think he's going to find his way on the field on Sunday. So I wouldn't be worried about that one. It sounds like Alex Collins with his abdomen issue is trending in the right direction to be able to play this weekend. But Travis Homer, after being limited on Wednesday, was out on Thursday. So we might still see Adrian Peterson or Josh Johnson get called up as a practice squad elevation. If Travis Homer isn't able to play, we'll see what the Friday injury report looks like for him. But that's just the way the running back position has been for the Seahawks. You get one guy back and then two guys are banged up. And that's the way it's been for about five years in the Pacific Northwest. So really overall, not a lot of encouraging signs on this injury report as of Thursday, but Friday could be a real difference maker. I would hedge bets that a good chunk of these guys, including Quandre Diggs, if I had to predict, I think he plays on Sunday, probably just resting him. Can't see Seattle going into this game without him or Adams. And they already lost Marquise Blair. Like I said, Ugo Amadi is probably your free safety in that case. But they seriously might be giving me a call and seeing if I'll sign a one-day contract because they don't have any safeties on their practice squad. This is a team that has very little depth now at that position. So I think Diggs will play. I expect that Metcalf is going to play. Shell, I would expect, is not going to be out there. We'll see what happens with Travis Homer. But certainly some injuries to watch heading into this game. Another one to watch as well is Brian Monet. I know the other side of the trench is there. He's been playing really well for the Seahawks this year. And I know they just signed Niall Scott to the practice squad, if I'm not mistaken. He's still there. Um, and maybe that is a, a hedge in case that uh, Brian Monet can't go. You want to, a guy that has his own orbit in the middle of the, the defensive line. And it would be a bummer if, you know, the, that uh, Brian Monet can't play because if the Texans do have some sort of prayer, it would probably have to be in the trenches in the run game. But um, and if you, you'd like all your horses in the stable, and certainly Brian Monet is the, the biggest one in the stable. Yeah, he's a big guy, and he played really well last week before he got injured. He did come back into the game with a knee brace on and finish the game up against the 49ers, but has not practiced the first two days this week. We'll see where he's at on Friday. Another one that really truly feels like it's a 50-50 proposition based on what we know and, and what I've seen, of course, at the facility as well. We'll have to see what happens when this final injury report comes out here. Probably going to happen while we're recording the show, uh, but the Seahawks hopefully will have most of their key players that have been banged up available against the Texans on Sunday. Let's talk keys to victory, but first, before we dive deeper into the game, Super Bowl 56 at SoFi Stadium is less than 100 days away. The two teams that are playing this weekend in Houston probably don't have a prayer of getting there, but... You can go to On Location, the official hospitality partner of the NFL. They're the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. Select your exact seats and choose from elite experiences, featuring an exclusive pregame celebration with NFL legends, five-star L.A. hotels, and food by the great Wolfgang Puck. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 for more information or search Super Bowl On Location. That's onlocationexp.com slash SB56, or search Super Bowl on location. This holiday season, make sure to grab yourself a Built Bar, a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, or even better than a candy bar. Built Bar is filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, but it's low in calories, sugar, net carbs, fat. It's high in protein, so you're getting the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. ton of amazing flavors. I could go on and on about double chocolate, cookies and cream, my personal favorite, peanut butter brownie. I'll eat an entire box in one sitting. Not embarrassed to admit that. Built Bar gives you that extra fuel you need to bust down those mall doors and battle all the holiday shoppers. Or if you're just standing in endless shopping lines, Built Bar can give you something a little extra to keep you going. So throw one in your jacket or purse. You never know when you're going to need it. And if you're friends with Santa, well, make sure to tell Santa to throw a few Built Bars into those stockings with so many flavors, they'd make anyone's Christmas morning a happy one. Go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCK15 this holiday season, and you'll get 15% off of your order. That's Built.com with the promo code LOCK15. 
All right, Nick, we're heading into this week 14 matchup, Seahawks at Texans, two teams with a combined six victories. So not necessarily a pre-Super Bowl matchup necessarily, but two teams that have not met expectations. I would at least say Seattle. Houston was going into this year. Everybody viewed this team as a dumpster fire with what they were dealing with, with Deshaun Watson, a new coach, a new general manager, a bunch of other key players like J.J. Watt no longer being in town. They truly are in the midst of an all-out rebuild in Houston. So this is a young team that's really struggled on both sides of the ball. The Seahawks are going to be heavily favored going to this game. But any given Sunday, any team can win. And even the Texans beat the Titans a few weeks back. They had the Patriots on the ropes earlier this year. So this is a team that has had a few games where they have stepped up to the plate against much superior competition and played well. So the Seahawks can't just skate into this game thinking it's already won. Looking at the offensive side of the ball, Nick, what are your keys for this Seahawks team to get their first two-game winning streak? They haven't had a winning streak this year. How do they achieve that in Houston on the offensive side of the ball this weekend? Well, the first thing that jump out jumps out to me is that the Texans are dead last in run defense. That is far and away the, the, the avenue, I think, that the Seahawks need to go in order to win this game and is the ground and pound. And, and you know that Pete Carroll, that's, those are, that's music to his ears. So, and, you know, it's, you know, Pete Carroll seeing a 32nd ranked defense, run defense is like me drilling over those Hagen dazs peppermint bark ice cream sandwiches from Costco. And it's just, it's, 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 uh, it's a good scenario for the Seahawks to be able to run the ball. The Texans have allowed at least 150 rushing yards in seven games this year and allowed over 200, I believe, 238 yards in their most recent game, the shutout loss to the Colts. And the Colts have a darn good running back and Jonathan Taylor, who ran wild against the Texans. And so I'm expecting the Seahawks, maybe not, you know, a guy going for 150. I think that the carries will be a bit more economic than that between guys like Collins and Rashad Penny, maybe Adrian Peterson, like you mentioned. But however it happens, the Seahawks have an opportunity here to not just establish the run, dominate in the run game, which almost guarantees the Seahawks winning a game if the Seahawks can dominate on run offense. If you can't run against this Texans defense, you have no business running against anybody. They've been that bad. A few of the games that I've watched, just poor gap integrity, the linebacker play, and now you just released one of your best linebackers because he's had issues in the locker room. But losing Zach Cunningham is a big talent drop-off for the Texans at linebacker. So they've got some major issues up in their front seven. They get a few players on their defensive line, but stopping the run – has been a major problem among many other problems. I would make an argument, aside from the pass protection and offense, that that's been the biggest issue they've had all year. They just cannot stop other teams from running the ball, and they fall behind, and then teams just keep churning it on the ground. So Seattle should be able to do that, and that leads into my second key. And again, some of these are always going to seem like, well, you could say this every week, but this week especially – when you believe you can run the ball the way they should be able to against this Texans defense, Russell Wilson is so darn good in play action. You should be running play action. You should be using play action to send this defense into submission. I mean, Russell Wilson shouldn't have any straight dropbacks as far as I'm concerned in this game. You're either handing it off or you're faking it and then throwing the ball. It needs to be a heavy priority in this game to run play action, because this is a very aggressive secondary for Lovey Smith's defense. They've got 14 interceptions this year, 18 turnovers, so they will create turnovers, but they've also given up nine pass plays of 40-plus yards. So it's truly a feast or famine defense. If you're running the ball well and you get that play action game going, those corners and safeties are going to bite, and they are going to get burned, especially if DK Metcalf's playing in this game. D. Eskridge finally starting to come into his own. Tyler Lock, and we know how reliable he is. Gerald Everett, he's not going to play like he did last week ever again. Get him established fairly early to get his confidence back up. They've got too many weapons, and the Texans, even though their secondary has probably been the best part of their team this year, it is still a group that can be exposed that doesn't necessarily have a ton of overall talent. So I think if you get that run game going and you're feeding off it with the play-action passing attack, this can be a game that you can put up 35, 40 points, no problem. They should have scored 40 against the 49ers last week. 49ers defense is much more talented than what this group is. Go out and do your job with the run game. Get that play-action passing game going, and there's no excuse. They should be able to have a fun day on offense on Sunday. 
Yeah, and just looking at the defensive back numbers, they, it is a strength. And I, I think it's one of those things where um, I think they're 15th in, in pass defense this year. And it might just be because the teams haven't needed to pass. <laughs> and That's part of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, Terrence Mitchell is the cornerback who's been targeted the most uh, for the Texans. He doesn't, he's allowing a 91.1 passer rating. And Desmond King, the free safety, is allowing a 99.6 passer rating. So certainly you no know, lockdown guys there in the secondary. Um, and yeah, that, that should open the play action should open up the offense. And like we mentioned in the first quarter, the, the right side of the offensive line is going to be a bit patchwork going to be a bit of experience. And this is a, this is a time to that play action pass the screens, the establish the run game. That is the kind of stuff that can really find a rhythm for an offensive line, especially when you're an experienced, like the right side of the line probably will be for the, for the Seahawks this game. I think that anything you can do to get them more comfortable, get their sea legs under them, is it, a positive thing. So I think all the things we talked about, establishing the run and the play action pass, getting the defensive line on their heels, getting the defensive line and pass rush to think about a few things besides getting after Russell Wilson, that'll only help the offensive line, the patchwork offense, offensive line that we're going to see on Sunday get into a rhythm. Looking at the defensive side of the football for the Seahawks, this is a Houston offense. I mentioned it earlier. They've had six games this year. They've scored nine or less points, single-digit points in full games. It has been the worst offense in the NFL easily. And one of the big problems they've had is a quarterback position. Tyrod Taylor had a few games early in the year where he played okay, but he's not a starter in the NFL. He's never been. He's proven to be a guy that can give you a solid game or two as a spot starter. And they got a third-round pick, a rookie in Davis Mills, who played really well against the New England Patriots. They almost pulled the upset earlier this year. But most of the games he's played in has really struggled, and a lot of it hasn't been his fault. He hasn't had pass protection in front of him. They don't have a lot of weapons on the outside. But this is a really easy game plan. You, you stuff the run. The Texans don't have a great running game, not even a good running game. You stuff that run game. You force Davis Mills to beat you, especially without Laramie Tunsil at left tackle, one of the best left tackles in the game. This offensive line – isn't great with him in the lineup. Without him, it's one of the worst in the NFL. If you're not going to be able to get to the quarterback in this game, you're not going to be able to get to the quarterback at all. So Seattle's pass rush should have a lot of success. Force Davis Mills to beat you with the limited weapons he has, the limited experience that he has. Like any rookie quarterback, you put pressure on him, you force him into tough throws, he is going to turn the football over. And he's had issues with that in the limited action he's had this year. So put the ball in his court and force him to be the one that beats you in this game. Yeah, I mean, Davis Mills has five games with a passer rating of less than 80 this year. So yep. he's been largely ineffective. But you mentioned he had 141.7 passer rating in that game against the Patriots. And maybe it's just one of those times where he just snuck up on people. But recently, 52.4 rating and, and getting shut out by the Colts, getting sacked twice. He's been sacked seven times in the last two games. Can turn the ball over to He has a four-interception game this year. So absolutely, he's not going to beat you. If the Seahawks make the, the Texans one-dimensional or zero-dimensional, <laughs> they th this, this will be a, a pretty easy win for the defense for sure. And another thing is, is Brandon Cooks. That is certainly when you're looking up and down the roster for the Texans, you think, okay, you know, who, who are the guys that you just recognize? And some of the guys <laughs> that are getting you know a lot of touches for the, for the Texans this year – I don't know who they are, to be honest. Or, you know, Dave, I was just talking before the show. I'm like, David Johnson's still a thing. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I mean, and he hasn't been for, for a couple games. Or, you know, Philip Lindsay's been dealt. And I didn't know Rex Burkhead was still a thing. But a guy certainly that jumps off the page, you know who he is, is Brandon Cooks, receiver. Mm -hmm. If there's a guy, he's probably the most talented skill player that the Texans still have. And so you absolutely can't let him beat you. And because he can, we, we've seen it firsthand that Brandon Cooks absolutely has the talent and ability to take games over. You know, we see in, in days with the Rams and with uh, the Saints and the, and the Patriots that he, he's a darn, darn good receiver and easily their best weapon in the pass game. So if you're forcing Dave, Davis Mills to beat you, that is where he's going to look, is the safety blanket in Brandon Cooks. You got to take it. You, you got to take that into account. Yeah, this is a game that I actually – Seattle very rarely does this, but I'm bracketing Brandon Cooks. Uh, Nico Collins, their rookie out of Michigan, is a decent player with good size. So he's their second receiver that's worth noting. But you got to take away Brandon Cooks and, and just make sure he can't get over the top because that's where he can really kill you with his speed, his ability as a deep threat. 
The other player on their offense that I think you got to slow down, and this is just dating back to the last couple weeks, I actually thought Seattle was doing better against tight ends most of the season, but Zach Ertz had a huge game, and then we obviously know George Kittle last weekend, 181 receiving yards. It felt like more than that, two touchdowns. Brevin Jordan is not either one of those players, a rookie out of Miami, a fifth-round pick. He's not the same caliber, but this is a kid that's got a couple touchdowns since he came off the injury list. He's got some upside. He was a player that we talked about in pre-draft about maybe the Seahawks having interest in because he's a guy that can stretch the field a little bit, has soft hands. Not a great blocker necessarily, but this is a good young tight end, and the Seahawks have had their issues defending that position in recent weeks. If Davis Mills is going to be able to move the ball against the Seahawks defense, he's going to try to get the ball to Brandon Cooks, but I think Brevin Jordan's going to be his number two outlet that security security blanket at tight end that he can go to in the short to intermediate game and also in the red zone. And so you got to find a way to bottle him up. And that onus is now going to fall on Ryan Neal, especially if they don't have Quandre Diggs in this game too. I mean, the backup safeties dealing with the tight end, that, that's going to be an intriguing matchup that maybe favors Houston a little bit going into this game. So they can't let Brevin Jordan and Brandon Cooks be the guys that really take over this game force the other guys in the outside to be the ones that win. And that just makes life even tougher for Davis Mills being a rookie quarterback behind a porous offensive line. We're going to get to our picks to click. But first I want to tell you guys, I tell you what, I, I am a sock connoisseur. Under Armour has normally been my go-to brand. But I got to tell you about Stance. If you're looking for comfortable, sleek-looking socks to change up your footwear game, Stance has got you covered. Founded in 2009, Stance Apparel represents a radical reinvention of socks, underwear, and active apparel. With a sharp focus on comfort, quality, and creativity, Stance brings an atypical aesthetic alongside some of pop culture's hottest collaborators for the ultimate in style and self-expression because everything you wear should be a direct extension of who you are and how you feel. So for me personally, I'm a superhero nerd by heart. I have two pairs of Star Wars and Batman designs coupled with amazing designs that match my personality and catch the attention of friends and family. They feel like you're wearing clouds on your feet. They're top-notch quality. I've worn both my pairs a bunch, and they've shown minimal signs of wear and tear too, which has always been a problem with my big feet. Stance believes that the perfect fit matters more than fitting in, that those who feel good do good. So go see for yourself with Stance. Register for an account at stance.com and get 15% off your first purchase. Use the promo code Locked On at checkout to apply. Enjoy the color and comfort of a life less ordinary with Stance. All right, week 14. It's, it's so weird saying that. You Normally I would say it's weird it's week 14, but this is a season that has felt like it has taken forever to get, to get going because the Seahawks have not been good. I'm sure that goes with all fan bases. I mean, Texans fans are probably like, can the season just end? And that's the feeling that comes with not being a good team. And the Seahawks, obviously at 4-8, and eight, have been dealing with the same emotions. The fan base has been fatigued by how disappointing this season has gone. But the playoffs are still within reach for at least one of these teams. At 2-10, and 10, the Texans, they're out of it. But the Seahawks at 4-8, and eight, they still mathematically are alive. As Lloyd Christmas likes to say, you're saying there's a chance. The Seahawks certainly still have one. They just have no margin for error. So let's talk picks to click. Seahawks going up against the Texans on the road here in Week 14. Starting on the offensive side of the ball, Nick, who is your pick to click you're rolling with this week? Boy, I mean, looking at the rankings, you know, throw a dart. It could be one of anybody. And uh, given that they're dead last in run defense, let's go that route. And and since, you know, Pete Carroll's obviously going to be salivating over that. And Jonathan Taylor for the Colts, 143 rushing yards, two scores last week. A fine running back in his own right. Probably better than any running back the Seahawks currently have on the roster. But I'm going to go Alex Collins because I, he's, he's getting healthy, I think, that he, a healthy Alex Collins is probably their number one back right now, um, just with, with the injuries of Chris Carson and, and how unreliable Rashad Penny has been. And Adrian Peterson is not the guy he once was. You know, he, it, it was pretty exciting to see him score a touchdown last week. And that was a pick to click, by the way, last week. And I toot my own horn for a second. Um, but I'm going to go Alex Collins. I, I think not only that, but I, I really, and Pete Carroll even said, quote, he has a chance to be really active in the game plan against the Texans. And that screams to me that he's going to get some touches. I'm going to go as far as to say he's going to get 100 yards rushing this game. It's going to be his second 100-yard rushing game of the year. Alex Collins, my pick to click. 
I'm going with a 100 yard rusher as well, but not the same guy. And, you know, our listeners are going to be like, gosh darn it, Corbin, you've promised time and time again you're not going to drink the Rashad Penny Kool Aid, but it's just so delicious. I can't help it. I got to go with Rashad Penny coming off last week's game. I just think this is a team. You look at the Texans, they can't stop the run, but in particular, they've really had issues with explosives in the run game. Who is the running back on the Seahawks roster? that's most likely to bust one if he gets to the second level, it is Rashad Penny. And I just think last week, obviously the the huge disclaimer here is he's got to stay healthy, which he hasn't been able to do. But as long as he's able to stay on the field, I really like this matchup for him. He's got to have more confidence with the way he played last week. I mean, that outstanding blitz pickup that he had, a couple really nice runs, that 27-yard catch on a screen that he nearly busted for a touchdown – He's got to have some of that confidence coming back after having a game like that. And I just look at this Texas defense. Who's going to chase him down at the second level? If he gets to the second level there and he can turn on that third and fourth gear, I think there's a chance it's going to be a game that he ends up hitting a home run. So I'm going to go as far as saying second career 100-yard rushing game for Rashad Penny. I'm going to say 106 rushing yards and a touchdown. He's going to find the end zone for the first time this year. So, I, yeah, I'm going in on Rashad Penny. I'll probably regret it because every time I've done this, something bad seems to happen, but I, I just can't help it. You know what? I've been doing it for three plus years. Got to go out with a bang at the end of his rookie contract. So I'm picking her shot penny. Now let's talk defense here. Who's your pick to click for the Seahawks on the defensive side of the football? Well, given that the Texans are 30th in pass block win rates, I'm going to go along the pass rushing side. And Daryl Taylor has one sack and just just one sack in his last six games after having a pretty strong start to the year. Kind of been in a lull. I'm not going to say he's been in a slump because he still played pretty well. Um, but as far as the sacks goes, it, it, it's dried up a little bit. He had that one sack against the Washington football team. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say that Daryl Taylor gets in there and harasses Davis Mills to the tune of it more than 1.0 sacks. So let's say 1.5 sacks, two whole sacks, however that goes. I think Daryl Taylor has his first multi-sack game of the season and thus his career and 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 starts to cap off a very solid you know pseudo rookie season i was gonna go with another pass rusher but i have changed my mind i'm gonna you know i'm gonna throw out an audible here because i think they're gonna be able to get pressure on davis mills with a wide variety of rushers i think they're gonna be able to get it done from the interior as well And I think the young quarterback is going to try to force the issue getting the ball to Brandon Cooks. And so my pick to click, I'm going to toot my horn here. I picked Quandre Diggs last week. He got an interception. I'm going for some luck in the secondary for a second straight week. Sidney Jones got ripped off against Arizona. He should have had his first interception. Well, he's going to get some redemption. He's going to get not one, but two picks against Davis Mills in this game. I think Mills is going to try to force the issue try to squeeze the ball into his one true stud receiver. And I think Sidney Jones is going to make him pay for rookie mistakes. So not one, two interceptions for Sidney Jones, defensive player of the game. Really bold, probably not going to happen. But you know what? I've had no luck for the most part with predictions this year. So go big or go home. Two picks for Sidney Jones. Real quick, Nick, I've had a chance to dish out my prediction for this week's game on our crossover episode how do you see this this game playing out here in Houston? Well, I've kind of thought it in two veins. One, I, I haven't felt this confident about a Seahawks game all season, maybe besides the Jaguars game. I would argue that the Jaguars are a bit better than the Texans are, at least this point in the season. Um, the Texans are really bad. They're, they're, they're not only bad, but they're just functional. And the Seahawks, the Seahawks should be able to run the ball at will. Russell Wilson can carve them up when needed. Six, the Seahawks are sixth in red zone offense. Texans are 21st in red zone defense. They should be able to take advantage of, of any and all weaknesses that the Texans have. The Texans are dead last in just about any offensive category you can think of or next to dead last. And naturally, it's going to be a 45-40 over to now. <laughs> um, I'm going to go uh, Seahawks win this game 30-13. to And, you know, it's I think that the, the Texans get some weird wonky points in there and of course, the Hawks Twitter will start getting heartburn, but I think it's a good, solid, multi-score victory. So naturally, they're going to win 30-29 to 29 on the last second field goal. <laughs> we talked about that before the show. That's that's typically how games like this end up playing out. It'd be nice to see the Seahawks 
go out and get a blowout because they could have had one last week if they would have been able to finish when they were in the Could be the Jets zone. game too from last year. Yeah, uh, that's the last time that we've really seen them go out. I mean, the, the Jaguars game, they had a blowout, but uh, it's really been a long time since Russell Wilson was under center and we've seen them blow somebody out. This feels like a game that's ripe for that, but you've got to go out and you got to play between the lines. It isn't just going to happen by showing up. And so the Seahawks have to be able to do that. You would think at four and eight, that would not be an issue. There should be a lot of urgency for this football team. As always, thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. Now make sure to make your second listen to Locked On Bets podcast, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Nick at Nick Lee 51 You can check out Locked On Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the Odyssey app. When I return on Monday, I'll be rejoined by my co-host, Rob Rang. Hopefully, we'll be celebrating a second straight victory Monday, breaking down a victory over the Texans. But regardless of the outcome, we'll be sharing our takeaways from Sunday's Week 14 contest in Houston. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the game. Go Hawks.